this feeling that something was terribly wrong with the world that we live in, but you couldn't figure out just what it was. Then you've come to the right place. Secret societies, mystery religions, and the Illuminati have been controlling our reality since the beginning of time. But not anymore, because there is an awakening happening, and you are about to become a part of it. By now, it should be obvious that the starry heaven is not an unmeaning, boundless, and trackless wilderness. They reveal a plan of mechanism or architecture that can be read as one would read the placements of the letters of the alphabet. An evangelic message they bring us gives faith in Jesus Christ as our Redeemer and the Savior of mankind. Our earliest patriarchs saw the importance of observing the glory of God as revealed in the stars for the benefit of their children and their children's children and for future generations. With comparably few stars visible to the unaided eye, for there were no telescopes at that period, it is marvelous with what ingenuity the figures in the constellations were arranged around the few stars visible to their eyes, to portray God's words and promises to Adam. The idea that the star pictures that we call the constellations or signs of the zodiac were not thus grouped by chance, but were designed or arranged on purpose as signs and symbols of certain truths, is almost universal. And although from very early times the signs or pictures in the stars have been related to a mythological system of fortune-telling, this series of studies of the zodiac has shown that the constellations, when properly revealed, are in perfect harmony with the scriptures, as they relate to Jesus Christ, from his birth, through his redemptive sacrifice on the cross, to the benefits he brought to his redeemed. To those who believe in God and in His written word, it will not seem unnatural or unlikely that He who revealed Himself to men naturally by the works of His hand and supernaturally by His servants, the prophets on earth, should in a different manner and with another pen inscribe some of His truth upon the starry sky. He created the stars and placed them in their respective positions. The idea that the constellations and their individual stars could contain a divine revelation is entirely possible. And as we have found in our previous studies, they obviously do. Even those who do not believe in a supernaturally inspired revelation cannot fail to note the remarkable correspondence between the scriptures and the writings in the sky. The extraordinary unity of plan, the countless analogies, to all together with the marvelous agreement of the pictures in the sky with the scriptures, not only suggest one authorship for both, but make the constellations a very valuable independent witness of the glory of God through Jesus Christ. We have now come to the final two major constellations, Cancer the Crab and Leo the Lion. Together with their minor constellations, they tell the story of the redeemed and the Messiah's consummated triumph. Cancer the Crab. This constellation is one of the faintest in the sky. It is practically impossible to view unless atmospheric conditions are very good. Modern zodiacs show this crab, but from the meaning of the star names making up this sign, it is evident that the original picture, as well as those of Cancer's first two minor constellations, has been lost, because the pictures do not agree with the meaning of their star names. In the Egyptian zodiac at Dendera, however, that provides the key to its true meaning. There, this sign is called Claria, meaning the folds, the resting places. This is in perfect harmony with all the other star names, as well as Cancer's Syrian name, which means holding or encircling. 
what we have implied is a sheepfold. And Revelation chapter 7 tells of Israel having a great multitude which no man could number, gathered with them before the throne and before the Lamb. That cancer represents a sheepfold, the multitudes of Israel, protected by the Good Shepherd, is further shown to us by the name of another star, al Hamarian, which in Arabic means the kids or lambs. As I mentioned before, Cancer's first two minor constellations no longer show their original pictures. The first minor sign, Ursa Minor, or the little bear, shows a bear with a long, uplifted tail. No such bear is found in nature or in any ancient zodiac. In Arabic, Duba means cattle. Its equivalent name in Hebrew is Dover and means a fold. And the word Dover means rest and security. This same word occurs in Deuteronomy 33, verse 25. As thy days, so shall thy strength be. The revised version gives in the margin, so shall thy rest or security be. Other star names found in Ursa Minor have meanings. The redeemed assembly, the calves, or young, as in Deuteronomy 22, verse 6, and the stronghold of the saved. Ursa Minor, which corresponds to the lesser sheepfold, could well represent the smaller company called the little flock that Christ mysteriously transfers as the church of the firstborn to heaven prior to his return to become his body. Ursa Major is the second minor constellation of Cancer. This constellation is one of the best known of all the heavenly constellations because its seven major stars, so well matched in brightness and so conspicuous as a group, are very well known as the Big Dipper. The handle of the Dipper, three stars, is in the tail of the bear's body. The other four stars, forming a bowl, lie in the hind part of the body. As in the case of Ursa Minor, we find no evidence of a bear in the meaning of the star names, making up this constellation. And again, we are dependent upon the ancient star names for the true meaning of this sign. The brightest star in the back is called Dubé, meaning a herd of animals or a flock. The next important star in the center of the body is named Merach, which means in Hebrew, the flock, and in Arabic, purchased. Other names mean the redeemed, company of travelers, and the sheepfold set or appointed. So according to the star names, we have no evidence of a bear, but rather in the two constellations, Ursa Minor and Ursa Major, we have two sheepfolds where his sheep are protected as described in Ezekiel 34, verses 12 to 14, which reads, As a shepherd seeketh out his flock in the day that he is among his sheep that are scattered, so will I seek out my sheep and will deliver them out of all the places where they have been scattered in a cloudy and dark day. And I will bring them out from the people and gather them from the countries. And I will bring them to their own land and feed them upon the mountains of Israel, by the rivers, and in all inhabited places of the country. I will feed them in a good pasture, and upon the high mountains of Israel shall their fold be. There shall they lie in a good fold, and in a fat pasture they shall feed upon the mountains of Israel. The third minor sign of cancer is Argo, the ship. This is the mythical ship of the mighty Argonauts, of which Homer sang nearly ten centuries before Christ. Many and varied are the suggestions to explain it. Some think that Noah's Ark gave birth to the story in the picture. But the evidence points to the prophetic 
rather than a record of the past. It is clear that when divested of mythical details, the ancient sailors, after all their experiences, came home victorious. The golden fleece for which they went in search tells of a treasure that had been lost. Jason the captain tells of him who recovered it from the serpent, who had guarded it with ever watchful eyes. Is not this the parable of the hidden treasure, the lost sheep of the house of Israel, hidden in the field of the world, found by the good shepherd, who then went and sold all he had and bought it with his blood? Argo is a large ship, as indicated by the immense size of the constellation, as well as the large number of its stars. The name Argo means company of travelers. In answers to the Revelation 7, verse 9, quote, a great multitude which no man can number. This idea harmonizes with the meaning of the star names that carry the following meanings, the possession of him who cometh, the multitude, the possession, the released who travel, and one star carries the significant name, the branch. In the Egyptian zodiac, Argo is pictured as the figure of a great ox, enclosed with a cross suspended from his neck. The name of this figure is Shes in Fin, which means rejoicing over the serpent. Although a different picture, it still expresses the same scriptural promise, the safe folding of his blood-bought flock into a kingdom of everlasting rest. This same thought is expressed in the words of Jeremiah, reading from Jeremiah 30, verses 10 and 11. Therefore fear thou not, O my servant Jacob, saith the Lord, neither be dismayed, O Israel, for lo, I will save thee from afar, and thy seed from the land of their captivity. And Jacob shall return, and shall be in rest, and be quiet, and none shall make him afraid. For I am with thee, saith the Lord, to save thee. John, in prophetic vision, looked over into that day as he wrote, in Revelation 7, verses 16 and 17, They shall hunger no more, neither thirst any more, neither shall the sun light on them, nor any heat. For the Lamb shall feed them, and wipe all tears from their eyes. And continue on in Revelation 21, verse 4, and there shall be no more death, neither shall there be any more pain, for the former things are passed away. These are promises that glowed in the hearts of the primeval patriarchs who saw them afar off and were persuaded of them and embraced them. On the imperishable stars they hung and pictured their confident belief and anticipation, whereby they being dead could speak for the comfort of future ages. We have now come to the last major constellation of the zodiac, Leo the Lion. There is no confusion about this sign. In all the ancient zodiacs of Egypt and India, as well as modern ones, we find a great lion in all the majesty of his fierce wrath. His feet are over the head of Hydra, the great serpent and just about to descend upon it and crush it. The Hebrew name of Leo is Arieth, which means the lion. There are six Hebrew words for lion, and the one used here is of a lion hunting down his prey. Leo's Syrian name is Aryo, meaning rending lion, while the Arabic name is Al-Assad, meaning a lion coming vehemently. In the Egyptian zodiac, the lion stands directly on the serpent's back and carries the name Pi Mintikayan, which means poured out. The hieroglyphics beneath the lion read Kim, meaning who conquers, referring, of course, to the victory over the serpent. The truth of this sign is self-evident to any student of the Bible. The lion of the tribe of Judah aroused 
for the rending of the prey. In the prophecy of Balaam, reading from Numbers 24, verses 8 and 9, He shall eat up the nations his enemies, and shall break their bones, and pierce them through with his arrows. He couched, he lay down as a lion, and as a great lion who shall stir him up. Isaiah describes the same scene in Isaiah 42, verse 13. The Lord shall go forth as a mighty man, he shall stir up jealousy like a man of war, he shall cry, yea, roar, he shall prevail against his enemies. This is what John the Revelator meant when he wrote in Revelation 5, verse 5, The Lion of the tribe of Judah, the Root of David, hath prevailed to open the book. And continuing in verse 12, Worthy is the Lamb that was slain to receive power and riches and wisdom and strength and honor and glory and blessing. All the stars in Leo magnify and exalt him as a coming conqueror and judge. The brightest star on the ecliptic is called Regulus, meaning treading underfoot. The next star in the tip of the tail is named Dinabola, meaning the judge who cometh. The other star names mean the judge cometh who seizes, the punishing or tearing of the lion, and the enemy put down. As nearly and fully as names can express it, we have the same things in the zodiacal Leo that we find described to the lion of the tribe of Judah in the Apocalypse. They both tell one and the same story, the story of the wrath of the Lamb in his great final judgment in which the mythical stone kingdom of the book of Daniel, a kingdom cut out of the mountains without hands, falls upon, breaks in pieces all other kingdoms and powers. Zephaniah 3 verse 8 also prophesies of that day. Therefore wait ye upon me, saith the Lord, until the day that I rise up to the prey. For my determination is to gather the nations that I may assemble the kingdoms to pour upon them my indignation, even all my fierce anger. For the earth shall be devoured with the fire of my jealousy. Even among these stupendous works of battle and judgment, as he exercises the powers and prerogatives of the lion, Christ never ceases to be the Lamb of God. By his sacrificial death and mediation, his people have achieved their redemption. He is the lion to his enemies, and to his friends the lamb, slain from the foundation of the world. By his blood the saints are washed from their sins, their garments made white, and their final victory over all of Satan's accusations assured. Such is the lion work of the root and offspring of David, as it was revealed to the Apostle John, and directed to be written for our learning. What is thus pictured in the last book of the Scriptures is the same that was foreordained in the last constellation of the Zodiac, before any book of our present Bible was written. In the three minor constellations of Leo, the work of the lion is more fully described. All three signs are pictured together. First is Hydra the serpent. Pictured here is an immense female serpent, whose length stretches one-third the way around the whole sphere of the heavens. Its uplifted head is near the little dog star, and its tail is pointed at Libra. The other two minor signs of Leo, Crater and Corvus, lie on the serpent's back side by side. The name Hydra means the abhorred or the fleeing. The bright star in the heart of the serpent is called al Farard in Arabic name that means the separated, put away. Another star name means the deceiver. The Bible states that Satan, once a good angel and chief among angels, kept not his first estate, but abused his free will to sin and rebel. 
He seduced our first parents into transgression, not as a literal serpent, but as a visible, treacherous, evil spirit who reappears again and again as he possesses men's souls and actions in the history and prophecies of the Scripture. The great mission of the promised seed of the woman was to bruise effectively the serpent's head. The two remaining minor consolations of Leo picture the fate of the great deceiver and all who are ensnared into the serpent's program to destroy God's people and hinder the establishment of his kingdom on earth. Crater the cup, the second minor sign, pictures a cup broad and deep and full to the brim. It is placed directly over the head of Hydra, the serpent. The two stars that determine the bottom of the cup form a part of the body of the serpent, indicating it is inseparable from the monster. This is no fabled wine cup of Bacchus of Greek and Roman mythology, but it is the cup of his indignation. As stated in Revelation 14, verse 10, and the cup of the wine of the fierceness of his wrath, as stated by Revelation 16, verse 19. Psalms 11, verse 6 says, Upon the wicked he shall rain snares, fire and brimstone, and a horrible tempest. This shall be the portion of their cup. Psalms 75, verse 8 states, For in the hand of the Lord there is a cup, and the wine is red, it is full of mixture, and he poureth out the same, but the dregs thereof, all the wicked of the earth, shall wring them out and drink them. This cup of divine indignation is the portion of the worshippers of the son of perdition, which is poured out without adulteration or dilution. Dreadful beyond understanding is a picture John the Revelator gives of this cup of unmingling and eternal wrath but no more dreadful than the picture of it which the primeval prophets have thus inscribed upon the stars. Our final picture is of a raven, the bird of prey. Known as Corvus the raven, it is seen grasping the body of Hydra the serpent with his feet and tearing the serpent's body with his beak. The Egyptians called this sign Herna, meaning the enemy broken. Every star name in this sign portends judgment and destruction, the curse inflicted, the raven tearing to pieces, and so forth. The scriptures often associate birds of prey with judgments and punishment. Reading from Proverbs 3, verse 17, The eye that mocketh at his father and despiseth to obey his mother the ravens of the valley shall pick it out, and the young eagles shall eat it. When David, the first great impersonation of Judah's lion, met the terrible Goliath, he cursed him in the name of the Lord, God of Israel, and said, reading from 1 Samuel 17, verse 46, I will smite thee and take thine head from thee, and I will give the carcasses of the host of the Philistines this day unto the fowls of the air and to the wild beasts of the earth. In Revelation 19, verse 17 and 18, the birds are summoned to gather for the task of clearing away the carnage in the final scene of slaughter that accompanies the coming of him who is King of King and Lord of Lord. When the serpent falls, the circle of time is complete And it is the day that John the Revelator wrote, reading from Revelation 21, verse 3, Behold, the tabernacle of God is with men, and he will dwell with them, and they shall be his people, and God himself shall be with them and be their God. Fulfilled then will be the words of Christ that he taught us to say, Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. As Christians, we look forward to that day with full assurances that God will keep his promises. We have it written, word of the prophets and apostles, the same is certified to us by the everlasting stars, 
in their ceaseless journeying around the pathway of the encircling year. On the face of the lovely stars it has been written from the beginning, the same as in the book, Satan's doom is sealed, the lion he cannot destroy. Satan's power will soon be seized by the almighty power. The father of lies will be crushed, torn, pierced, and forced to drink to the cup of eternal wrath, while the moldy-headed body, in which he has operated through all the ages, is given to the birds of prey to be devoured. We began with Virgo, we ended with Leo, and found the origin and purpose of the Zodiac. There can be no question but that the gospel glows in these heavenly constellations with all the luster of the stars themselves. God has been all through the ages proclaiming from the starry sky the glories, sufferings, triumphs of the Virgin's child. Can we close our eyes to the testament of the stars? To do so is to go against the laws of evidence. Can there be any doubt that the zodiac is a primeval fountain of divine truth. If there is, it is against the principles of logic. The zodiac is primeval Bible astrology, which is symbology of astronomy, the earliest revelation to mankind from his creator. Satan perverted God's astrology, substituting in his place a mythological system designed to control the entire world through fortune-telling, sorcery, and witchcraft. Horoscopic astrology speaks of mysterious influences which emanate from the so-called houses of the heavens, which relate to the signs of the zodiac. Biblical astrology, on the other hand, had nothing at all to say about forces influencing one's destiny. It is simply telling the gospel of Jesus Christ through the names which God gave the stars. Biblical astrology proclaims the story of the one whose self-given name is the light of the world, who dwelt in the midst of the twelve tribes of Israel, that they might behold his glory. It is evident that after the original meaning of the constellations became lost, nations invented stories from their imaginations. The Greek mythology is erroneous interpretation of the stars and signs after their true meaning had been forgotten. The heathen in their blindness could not understand the celestial story and did not know what to make of the foreshowing, but in the light of God's fuller revelation found in the scriptures, we read the origin and meaning of it all. Agnostics have long offered virgin-born saviors, messiahs, or sons of God, preceding the Christian era as criticism of the orthodox Christian position. Such claims are no longer valid in the light of celestial revelation. All world religions do show a common origin by similarities, but it only proves that in the beginning all mankind was given God's plan for humanity. In such case, Having foreknowledge of a virgin-born Savior, it was no problem for corrupt priests to fabricate one, and every ancient religion did just that. In spite of its confusion and conflicting doctrines, only in Christianity can be found the fountain, that is fundamental idea, of the gospel of the stars. Ancient religions may imitate crucified saviors, Modern religions may corrupt the words of the book, but neither can touch the stars in the heavens that do declare the glory of God as embodied in the person, mission, work, and redemptive achievements of His only begotten Son, Jesus Christ. Our God Yahweh is a God who knew the end from the beginning. He laid out a perfect plan before He created a single thing on our earth. He pictorially inscribed in the everlasting stars before creation. This perfect plan, which included and determined all the events of history in the most minute detail with the central purpose to reveal His glory in Jesus Christ, who spread the stars across the universe 
to shine like diamonds in a vaulted hall. He broadcasts them as hand-sown seeds might fall, or as coins spilled out of some rich king's purse. He then made man for better or for worse, and placed him on a tiny spinning ball that whirled around one of the stars so small, yet I have heard man give to him the curse. Would man in his own adoration bask, denying God performed this mighty task? Oh yes, we have these hands, this brain of ours, and these are free with no restraining bars. But lest you be conceited with your powers, man, make for me a galaxy of stars. We have covered all the twelve constellations of the Zodiac. The concluding take number six of this series will present a short study on the science of astronomy, the handiwork of God, the creator of the universe. Now let tape run out before turning over for duplicate recording of this tape. There is no branch of science that confirms faith in God more than does astronomy. By searching the heavens, we do not find God, but we are able to see the glory of His creation and fathom some of the bewildering complexity of structure and motion of the starry systems which obey divine law. We cannot delve into the science of the stars without feeling humbled and insignificant. We are reminded of the word of David, for he declared... Let me sing of this thy heavenly strength, like tiny children lispen out thy praise. For as I look up to the heavens thy fingers made, the moon and stars that thou hast shaped, I ask, what is man that thou shouldest think of him? What is mortal man that thou shouldest heed him? In his divine comedy, Danny declared, I raise my eyes aloft and behold the scattered chapters of the universe gathered and bound into a single book by the austere and tender hand of God. Modern astronomy tells of a dramatic story of how the boundaries of the universe have been pushed back by long and arduous research in various fields of science. The physicists who discovered how to release the power of the atom had helped to give us a new concept of the starry heavens. The chemists who have learned how to identify elements and the compounds by unique means have helped solve some of the mysteries of our solar system. The universe that the ancients knew was vastly different from the ones we are acquainted with today. In the days of Abraham, only five planets could be seen by the eye of man, and it was not until late in the 18th century that the sixth planet, Uranus, was discovered. Mathematical calculations and great telescopes made it possible to bring another planet, Neptune, to the gaze of astronomers in 1846. However, it was not until the third decade of our present century that painstaking research brought Pluto into view, a planet twice as far from the sun as Uranus. Therefore, an expanding solar system swings into our view today, for we have nine planets, including our Earth, to study. The Egyptians and Babylonians observed the stars, charted course of the planets, and correlated the motions of heavenly bodies with the calendar, but they did little more. They were content to enjoy the pageant of the heavens without troubling themselves with the how or why of their existence or the laws of their movements. The Greeks recognized the difference between the fixed stars and the planets and gave them names, many of which are still in use today. In most instances, these names continued the same meaning as the earlier ancient Hebrew, Persian, and Arabic names that have come down from remote times. When telescopes were perfected, astronomers found the number of stars so immense that the task of naming all of them became impossible. Therefore, they tagged the principal stars of a constellation with the letters of the Greek alphabet. Alpha, the brightest, beta, the second brightest, and so on. But since there were not enough letters in the alphabet to attach to all the stars that have been discovered, astronomers in recent years have cataloged and numbered the stars according to their position. Thus, 21 Virgo refers to star 21 in the constellation Virgo, the Virgin. Fainter stars are designed by numbers in star catalogs, such as the Henry Draper catalog, 
An example of which would be HD 12,953. <clears throat> Although men are not able to name the countless millions of sons, it is awe-inspiring to remember that God calleth them all by names by the greatest of his might. Isaiah 40, verse 26. Plato realized there was an order to the universe, for he asked, What are the circular and perfectly regular movements presented by the wandering stars? Aristotle believed the earth was round and that it evolved. He too thought that there was a great spheres which filled the space between the heavenly bodies. Heraclides, the philosopher, noticed that the planets Mercury and Venus did not move very far from the sun. Because of this, he suggested they might actually revolve around the sun, and the sun in turn revolve around the earth. However, no one in his day took his suggestion seriously. Aristarchus, who lived in the third century before Christ, proposed a simple and daring view of the heavens. He suggested that the sun was the center around which the planets revolved, and he went so far as to make an attempt to measure the distances from the earth to the sun and the moon. His reasoning was correct, but his instruments for measurements were too crude to give him accurate results. Eighteen centuries later, Copernicus was to advocate the same theory. Claudius Ptolemy, the last of the great ancients who lived in Alexandria about A.D. 150, gave Greek astronomy an organized system of thought about the universe which prevailed in man's thinking for over 1,400 years. He extended the ideas of his predecessors, who said that the earth was motionless in the center of the heavens, and that the planets moved in small circles, whose center moved in turn around the earth. The Ptolemaic system was based upon the obvious appearance of the starlit sky, and it was adopted by thinking and unthinking people alike. Upon this view of the universe was based the religious and scientific thought of the Middle Ages. Danny's The Divine Comedy and Milton's Paradise Lost were written around this concept of the heavens and the earth. Nicholas Copernicus upset the Ptolemaic theory when he published his views in the middle of the 16th century. His treatise appeared in Latin, and his English title is Concerning the Revolutions of the Celestial Spheres. This Polish scientist, churchman, painter, poet, physician, and soldier, found time to work out an entirely new system of astronomy which completely changed man's ideas about the universe. He taught that far out in space there were fixed stars that were immovable. He said the earth was not the center of the universe, but that it rotated on its axis and moved in an annual orbit around the sun. The other planets, according to Copernicus, also moved around the sun, and the various phenomena of the heavens could be explained in harmony with these assumptions. Thus our world, formerly thought to be stationary, was set spinning through the heavens, and new vistas of the universe were open to the mind of man. But Copernicus did not live to see his view accepted, for his manuscript of his book was not sent to the printer until the author was almost 70 years of age. Before the printing was completed, the scientist became seriously ill and died. When other scientists read the book by Copernicus, they immediately raise a number of objections to his theory. Some of the doubters said that Venus should show phases similar to those of the moon if the planets actually revolved around the sun. Copernicus was aware of this problem, and he said God was good and someday he would show the phases of Venus to someone. His prophecy came true, for in succeeding centuries, the phases of Venus have been carefully observed many times through telescopes. Galileo and his successors proved the truth of the Copernican view by scanning the night sky with telescopes. With his optic tube, as he called it, Galileo in 1610 saw four moons revolving around Jupiter, the first objects in the solar system to be discovered by man beyond what his eyes alone had seen. Since Galileo's time, our knowledge of the universe has continued to increase until today man attempts to fathom the immensity of space and to comprehend the most infinite number of blazing suns, the nebulae, and the galaxies that move through the universe. If you have trouble visualizing the solar system of which the, our Earth is a member, 
consider for a moment a scale devised by Dr. Fletcher Watson, by which we can compare the size and distance of the sun and planets. If we take an orange to represent our sun, the earth would be a tiny pinhead 27 feet from the orange. Between the earth and the sun is a shining grain of sand, mercury, and Venus, another tiny pinhead. Look out 14 feet beyond our speck of earth, and we find another grain of sand, Mars. Now we shall have to begin walking to reach the outer planets of our solar system. From the orange to Jupiter, which is represented by a small marble, will be 140 feet. Saturn, the size of a pea, is 120 feet beyond Jupiter. Uranus, no larger than a small pill, lies 510 feet from the orange, a good long city block. Neptune is another small pill, 800 feet from the orange. While Pluto, the latest discovered planet of our solar system, must be represented by another pinhead, 1,100 feet from the orange, over two city blocks in distance. But we are only on the threshold of the universe when we have traveled to the farthest corner of our solar system. Our solar system is in the Milky Way, the common term for the galaxy, which in Greek means milky. Almost all the stars we see with the naked eye, as well as millions of others too far away or too faint to be observed except through a telescope, are a part of our galaxy. Our sun, whizzing through space at approximately 12 miles per second, sinks into insignificance when we find that there are from 1 to 200 billion suns in our Milky Way system. Our system is a great swarm of stars isolated in space, said Dr. Edwin Hubble of Mount Wilson Observatory. He continues, It drifts through the universe as a swarm of bees drifts through the summer air. End of quote. The entire galaxy, or Milky Way, of which our solar system is a particle, is rotating at a high speed around a center in the heavens. It requires 200 million years for this galactic system to rotate once, and in it move giant suns, some gathered in groups called globular clusters, some traveling in twos and threes, and some speeding alone on their appointed course. In this system are bright and dark nebulae, believed to be mammoth clouds or particles of cosmic dust. The stars of our galaxy vary greatly in size, density, and brightness. They do not all give off a steady, constant light. Some of the stars flare up and fade in brightness from hour to hour, while others take months to go through their period of variation. One group of stars, known as white dwarfs, have amazing characteristics that are almost unbelievable. An example is Cyrus B, through only 26,000 miles in diameter, a little more than three times the diameter of the Earth. It has a mass 250,000 times that of our planet. In other words, a tablespoon of the material of this star weighs a ton, and a piece no larger than a grain of sand weighs over a pound. The force of gravity exerted by this star, said Dr. E. C. Pickering of Harvard College Observatory, would cause the average man to weigh 2,600 pounds if he were upon its surface, and would flatten him out so thoroughly that he would have to be picked up with a razor blade if you could lift the razor blade. Now consider the speed at which these billions of suns and their planets are moving. At race it seemed almost unbelievable. We know our sun is traveling at the rate of 12 miles per second, which is about 540 billion miles a year, but this is a relatively so low motion on the celestial highways. The 20 stars nearest the Earth have an average transverse motion of 31 miles per second, while Arcturus is traveling 85 miles per second. Twin stars in the constellation of the Swan race around each other at the incredible rate of 1,500,000 miles per hour, or 25,000 miles per minute. And although the two suns are over 11,500,000 miles apart, they completely circle each other in less than two days. How large is our galaxy? It is so wide that light requires about 100,000 light years to cross it. 
A light year is the distance that light, moving at a speed of 186,500 miles per second, travels in one year. Although this is equivalent to some 6 trillion miles, yet our immense universe has made even this giant yardstick inadequate to measure the actual vastness of space. As we look at the galaxy on a dark night, it seems to be a belt or band of stars across the sky. We might think of it as a wheel about 10,000 light years thick and 100,000 light years in diameter. Our Earth and little solar system is about one half to two thirds the way out from the center, or about 30,000 light years from the hub of the galaxy. Since there are billions of giant suns in this space, we might imagine that they are crowded together in a traffic jam. This is not true, however, for the nearest star to the Earth is over 25 trillion miles away. It takes light 4.28 years to reach our eyes from the star that is our, is our next door neighbor. But we have not yet formed the complete picture. There are millions of other galactic systems or island universes similar to our Milky Way. Each of these separate galaxies comprises a universe in itself with millions of suns and perhaps billions of planets as large as or larger than those that revolve around our sun. Altogether, there seem to be about a dozen galaxies within a million light years from us. As we leave our near neighbors and push further out into space, we find fewer galaxies in proportion to the distance. At three million light years, an increase of 27 times the volume surveyed, only another dozen galaxies have been located. But at this point, we are only at the frontier of the universe, for photographs are now being made of galaxies 500 million light years away. Our minds stagger at the immensity of space, infinitude of time, for these pictures show the position of these galaxies as the light left them half a billion years ago. Great as a conquest of space has been, it is not possible at the present time to determine whether the billion observed universes represent a sizable part of the physical cosmos, or if they merely constitute a figurative drop in the infinitude of space. As astronomers probe at infinity and seek the depths of space, they have found no indication of a boundary, nor is there good evidence that there might not be one if we went out far enough. Although the universe is beyond our comprehension, we can come to one conclusion regarding its origin. An omnipotent creator called it into existence. We see it everywhere the handiwork of the creator. Of all the ancient nations, the Hebrew writers alone grasped the truth concerning the universe. The prophets of Israel of old saw the wonders of the heavens as the handiwork of God. We can truly say with the learned Job, Lo, these are but the outskirts of his ways. And how small a whisper do we hear of him? But the thunder of his power, who can understand? And how magnificent is the statement in the opening chapters of Genesis? And God made the two great lights, the greater light to rule the day, and the lesser light to rule the night. He made the stars also. Genesis 1.16 What a thrilling conception of the heavens is revealed in those five simple words, He made the stars also. The author of those words writes as if he expects everyone to know, without his need of repeating it, that the Almighty created the stars. He seemed to add this clause as an afterthought, a fact so universally known that it scarcely needed to be stated. And yet there are many in this century of enlightenment who refuse to see the splendor of the heavens, the power and the order of God who created the universe, and who upholds it with his power. Why can they not believe? as did John Dryden when he wrote, This is a peace too fair to be the child of chance and not of care. No atoms causally together hurled could e'er produce so beautiful a world. No, our world is not merely a little gob of earth with its splash of ocean, wisp of atmosphere, and smear of biology. No, it is a planet in the solar system and our sun and its attending planets are a part of a great galaxy, and the galaxy is a part of the infinite universe, created and upheld by the Eternal One. 
Ralph Waldo Emerson once wrote, If the stars should appear one night in a thousand years, how would men believe and adore, and preserve for many generations the remembrance of the city of God which had been shown? But every night come out these envoys of beauty, and light the universe with their monishing smile. How true is that statement? Because we see them often, these miraculous lamps in the sky, they have become commonplace to us. We rush headlong in the rut of everyday existence, failing to lift our eyes to the pageant of the stars, the eternal jewels of night. Look through a small telescope, and you will see the suns of the universe blaze with very colored lights that vie with the rainbow for beauty. You will see bright red stars, shimmering blue ones in the constellation of Orion, the brilliant white stars of Cyrus, the yellow stars like our sun and the great star Capella, and vivid orange spheres, of which Arcturus is one. Look up into the dome of night on an autumn evening, and you will see stretching diagonally from northeast to southeast across the sky, the jeweled belt of the Milky Way. What seems to be a cloud of light resolves itself into unnumbered individual stars when viewed through a large telescope. Man has dimmed the beauty of the starry night with flashing neon signs and glaring headlights, but stand on a mountain top in the stillness of a dark night and observe the heavens, declare the glory of God. No sight that the human eyes can look upon is more provocative or of awe than is a night sky scattered thick with stars. If we observed the stars more frequently, the experience might shrink our egos and put the sense of wonder in our hearts. The prophet Amos, in his task of herding sheep in the days of ancient Israel, watched the silent stars above the hills of Palestine. Some of the wonder of God's creation filled his soul, and when he called his people to a revival of justice and true religion, he said, Seek him that maketh the seven stars and Orion. His message has much more significance today than it did when it was uttered some 2,500 years ago, since telescopes have revealed many secrets of the Pleiades and Orion which were then unknown. No man can be a lover of astronomy and an atheist at the same time. Those words were spoken by Dennis Olmsted, 19th century astronomer of Yale University. And before a gathering of 5,000 scientists, Dr. Robert A. Milliken testified, I have an effect, he said, fingerprinted God in the heavens. I found a creator continually on the job. That this vast cosmos is a handiwork of God, the master designer, is clearly stated by Paul the Apostle when he affirms, quote, All things were created by him and for him, and he is before all things, and by him all things consist. The meaning of these words is amplified in Weymouth's translation, which reads, Through him the universe is one harmonious whole. Yes, we live in the universe of miracles, which a thinking man cannot deny. Miracles couched in the language of God, and as we explore the immensities of the starry sky and contemplate the stupendous power displayed, we can sum up the wonder of it all in seven simple words. The heavens declare the glory of God. As a mind grasps the significance of our solar system, expanded today by the discoveries of astronomy, it is natural for us to ask, is there life on other planets? Are these neighboring worlds inhabited by creatures similar to man and the animals on the earth? Do other suns we call stars have planets revolving about them? And do they move in harmony with the laws of the universe? Astronomy can give no conclusive answer to those questions, but there have been numerous discoveries in recent years which lead to interesting speculations. Atmospheric conditions, as accurately as they are known, would seem to eliminate the possibility of living beings existing on any of our neighboring planets, if the requirements for life are similar in other parts of the universe to those on our own Earth. However, it is almost impossible for one who has faith in a Creator who made the worlds to think that our little planet is the only one that was made to be inhabited, and that throughout the vast deeps of space, nowhere but on our own little Earth can life be found? It is more logical, I should say it's more illogical, to believe that none of the world's other solar systems are inhabited. 
In all probability, some of the suns of the universe have planetary systems, although we could never hope to see them with our telescopes. And some of these planets could possibly have climatic conditions similar to that of our Earth, and inhabited by intelligent beings. This concept of the universe is in harmony with the inspired testimony of the prophet Isaiah. Concerning the purposes of the creation of the earth, he wrote, For thus saith Yahweh that created the heavens, the God that formed the earth and made it, that established it, and created it not a waste, or in vain margin, that formed it to be inhabited. Isaiah 45, verse 18. Accepting the major premise that God created the earth for special purposes, namely, to be the dwelling place of his creatures, it is logical to believe that his great design calls for some other planets to be inhabited. The latest findings of astronomers have concluded there are many satellites worthy of the name planet that attend other stars. No human eye will ever see them as we view Venus and Mars, for they are too distant, but only the effect of these non-luminous bodies upon the stars to which they owe their allegiance is known. The laws of the universe are so perfect that mathematical calculations have shown irregularities in the course of stars that the only logical reason for such variances is the presence of heavenly bodies or planets near enough to affect the stars. There is no logical reason to suppose that our sun is any better fitted to have planets about it than thousands of others, or that the planet Earth should be highly exceptional. It is difficult to believe that a similar development has not occurred for vast numbers of other suns. The noted astronomer Dr. David Todd, director of Amherst College Observatory, said, The chances must be overwhelmingly in favor of vast numbers of the planets on the other solar systems be in favorable circumstance as to heat and moisture for the maintenance of life at the present time. That is, they are habitable, and if habitable, then no doubt thousands of them are inhabited now. As the immensity of the universe unfolds, we can better understand why the Old Testament writers should be inspired to say of the Creator, It is He that is sitteth upon the circle of the earth, and the inhabitants thereon are as grasshoppers. Isaiah 40, verse 22. As we observe the thousands of suns through powerful telescopes and recognize the grandeur and beauty of God's sympathy of stars, we wonder, why should the creator of the universe care for such creatures as man on one of the tiniest planets in the solar system that is dwarfed by star clusters and galaxies? Why should the creator of the universe care for man who has turned his back upon him and disobeys his commandments? We say with David, What is man that thou shouldest heed him? The answer is the mystery of divine love. We have a creator who not only made millions of sons, but he loves man that he created in his image. Although man became sinful and disobedient, God came in the form of a son to live with man, die for man, that we might be brought back into the family of God. While the stars testify of the creator's wisdom and power, it is in the death of Jesus Christ that we see the clearest revelation of the Father's love and mercy. It was on the cross of Golgotha that God's love focused in its greatest intensity as he redeemed his people from the penalty that doomed them. No, we are not insignificant in the eyes of God. And although our world may be only one of millions in the starry sky, every human being made in the image of the Creator is precious. For God so loved this little planet that he gave his only begotten Son, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. John 3.16 Thus saith the Lord, which giveth the sun for a light by day, and the ordinances of the moon and of the stars for a light by night, which divideth the sea when the waves thereof roar, the Lord of hosts is his name. If those ordinances depart from before me, saith the Lord, then the seed of Israel also shall cease from being a nation before me forever. Isaiah 31, 35. Look up in the sky. The sun, moon, and stars are still up there, which gives us assurance that we will continue as a nation to await the day for which we pray thy kingdom come on earth as it is in heaven. May God hasten that day.